subject to a yoke of slavery. So we're rejoicing in God's victory. Our hearts responding to His love. to uh, worship together, isn't it? I have to say it was a, a, a heavenly sound this morning um, as we just uh, broke into that sort of spontaneous worship. There was, a, there was a kind of almost a heavenly presence. I just felt that was uh, fantastic. So um, to all of you who are involved in that worship, thank you so much. I really, uh, really love it. Really appreciate it. I think Sue's taking the... Are you taking the guys out there? Yeah, Okay. So I think they're going off to uh, do their bit this morning. Good, thank you. Okay, so we're continuing our, our studies in the book of Micah. If you've got your Bible or your device open and you'd like to turn to chapter 3, that would be really useful. I'll just get my phone because my Bible's on my phone. Let's, um, let's turn to the Scriptures and read the Scripture, shall we? Micah chapter 3. So this is uh, the prophet Micah speaking. Then I said, listen, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, should you not embrace justice? You who hate good and love evil, who tear the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, who eat my people's flesh, strip off their skin and break their bones in pieces, who chop them up like meat for the pan, like flesh for the pot, and they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. At that time, he will hide his face from them because of the evil they have done. As for the prophets who lead my people astray, they proclaim peace if they have something to eat, but prepare to wage war against anyone who refuses to feed them. Therefore, night will come over you without visions and darkness without divination. The sun will set for the prophets and the day will go dark for them. The seers will be ashamed and the diviners disgraced. They will all cover their faces because there is no answer from God. But as for me, says Micah, I am filled with power by, with the Spirit of the Lord and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression, to Israel his sin. Hear this. You leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel who despise justice and distort all that is right, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with wickedness. Her leaders judge for a bribe, her priests teach for a price, and her prophets tell fortunes for money. Yet they look for the Lord's support and say, is not the Lord among us? No. Disaster will come upon us. No disaster will come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble, the temple hill, a mound overgrown with thickets. God will bless the public reading of his word. 
Across the nation, then, a new wave of corruption, exploitation, and injustice has broken out. The societal values of decency, morality, and fairness have been discarded, and the new values of selfishness, deceit, and unrestrained immorality have emerged as societal norms. The religious leaders of the day have all but given away their moral and spiritual authority, and the wealthy take advantage of the weak and the poor, accumulating more wealth and land they could ever need whilst exploiting and abusing their workers. The insidious infiltration of the new religion of self, the manipulation of people, service and worship, outright lies and fabrications of the truth, dressed to look as if it is the truth, Remember, if you say it long enough and loud enough, listeners will believe it. The religion of individualism, it's all about me, the, and polytheism, any way to any God is fine as long as it suits my agenda, has all but blinded the eyes of the nation and have led to the extremes of exaggerated and disconnected religious practice. Who am I talking about? Sounds like today. Sounds like today. Who says the word of God is not living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, speaks directly into the situation we find ourselves now, even though this was written some 2,800 years ago, possibly? <coughs> History repeats itself constantly. It's cyclical. Pretentious and elaborate forms of worship are used to cover over the true lack of connection to God. This is the message of Micah, the prophet from Moresheth, prophesying in the 8th century BC. He could be a contemporary prophet today as he speaks into the erosion of true Christian worship. We know from John's preach a few weeks ago that he's a contemporary of Isaiah, of Amos, of Hosea, and spoke his prophecies during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, sort of 735 to 687 BC. Some 48 years of turbulent history when the threat of invasion and defeat gave cause for great concern. I hope you love Bible history. We were taught Bible history in Bible college. Uh, we had to name every king of Judah, every king of Israel in chronological order. I, it's incredibly uh, liberating to see how the Bible and history live together. If you're a, a, at all a theological student, then that's a really good place to start, uh, actually seeing how history and the Bible live together so closely. So the Assyrians and the Babylonians were coming. Eventually, in 722 BC, the northern kingdom would be overthrown by Shalmaneser V of the Assyrian dynasty, and his captives would be scattered all over the Assyrian kingdom. Shalmaneser then populated the territory with other peoples from other nations whom he had conquered. Hence the hatred that existed between Jews and Samaritans in Jesus' time. They were an unpure people, the Samaritans. They were a mix of all sorts of different peoples from all over the then known world who had come under force, almost slavery, to populate this area. Micah was able also to predict prophetically that Jerusalem would fall, as well as Samaria, of course they're the two capital cities, which took place in 586 BC by the Babylonian emperor Nebuchadnezzar. Jeremiah records in 26, uh, Jeremiah 26 verse 17, uh, that the officials of Judah remembered the prophecy of Micah. Micah prophesied that the defeat and the subsequent exile of the Judean populace would bring about the purposes of God. Maybe in this day we feel, we feel too that we're about to be invaded. Maybe we feel uncertain. Maybe we don't feel safe. Not by the Assyrians or the Babylonians because they've, <laughs> their time's over. But by other more insidious things, maybe like terrorism or technology or data accumulation or artificial intelligence. Uh, a sense of being caught up in world events that make no sense and have neither rhyme nor reason. Exploitation, manipulation and corruption are evident and seem to be gaining traction. 
into this fear and apprehension, then the Word of God speaks like a clarion call. It essentially asks us to trust, to have faith, to believe. There can be no greater assurance, no more powerful message than our God reigns and has the world in his hands. The psalmist is able to say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The authority and the power of God will never desert us. The message of Micah, then, is one which stressed the essential righteousness and morality of God. He was concerned to point out that these qualities had pressing ethical implications for the life of the individual and the community alike, because knowing Jesus and following God does not just simply exist in a vacuum. If it's just some kind of box that you open and, put, and let God out at certain points in time or in your life or certain uh, occasions when you maybe come to church or when you're going to life group or something happens and you say, oh, I need God, let's open the box. See, that's not the way that the Bible says that we should be engaging with God. God has, would like to have uh, complete access to all of our lives all of the time. If the people of Israel and Judah were to take their covenant obligations at all seriously, the justice which characterized the nature of God must be reflected in a similar state of affairs among the people of God. You who hate justice, verse 1. It's not just that pagan religious practices had infiltrated the religious consciousness of the nation. You okay? The exploitation of the poor by the wealthy and the manipulation of the covenant relationship with God for illicit gain and profit is at the heart of Micah's message. He warned those who wrongly deprived others of their possessions that God was devising a drastic punishment for them. His denunciation of the rulers of Israel and the false prophets envisaged the ultimate destruction of Jerusalem because the corruption which they represented had permeated to the core of national life. Judgment and punishment is a characteristic of God's nature that we skip over to our detriment. God is not to be messed with. God is a God of justice, a God of righteousness, who can only ever do the right thing. And if you stand in his way, you better watch out. This is not, this is not kids' games we're playing. This is life. Remember always that God wants the best for you. God loves you. But woe betide you if you turn around and say, I'm getting in the way of your purposes, God. Because that's exactly what happened to these people here. You see, God retains those qualities even now. Where there is corrupted worship, unbiblical practices, and pseudo-idolatry, his right to exercise his judgment and punishment is immutable. Shall I say that again? Where there is corrupted worship, unbiblical practices, and pseudo-idolatry, his right to exercise his judgment and punishment is immutable. Just so, in chapter 3 of this amazing prophecy... We have, in essence, before us, a courtroom scene, a drama unfolding. In the dock, the accused are the leaders of Israel, the civil leaders, the priests, and the prophets. Let's look at the charges, let's look at the witness, and let's look at the sentence and see what we can learn. So firstly, then, the charges that have been brought against these people. Micah describes in graphic detail the effect of corrupt judges who would rule in favor of those able to pay the biggest bribe. He describes it as a form of cannibalism. They eat my people's flesh. They gobble them up. I mean, have you ever, have you, have you ever seen big business? Big business gobbles you up. Big business is to be wary of. I'm not saying it's not a good thing. I'm just seeing, saying um, they have that effect of sort of uh, overcoming and, uh, and taking over uh, other things. 
Isn't that what we do when we buy unfairly traded products from the developing world? Or when companies pay money into slush funds to win contracts? Or to perfect, and this, this really winds me up, this is one of my, one of my pet hates, uh, where we protect our financial loans to developing countries and we insist on repayment schemes and monetary reforms that are not in the best interest of those people. Oh, we'll give you aid, but it's conditional. We'll give you a loan, but we'll take back far more than you, we ever lent you. Where's the justice in that? How are we helping people? We're not helping people. We're gaining from their sorrow and their pain. I, I, I hate injustice. I, I, I loathe it. The civil leaders then are condemned for exploiting the people. They take bribes. They take land. They take possessions from people who have very little. And so the wealthy get wealthier and the poor get poorer. The religious leaders then teach for hire and the prophets tell lies. If the decisions of the judges could be bought, the message of the prophets depended on their stipend. In other words, how much can you pay me depends on how what I say. Keep them happy and they would pronounce God's peace. Annoy them and they would bring down God's judgment. The clergy exploited people by promising God's blessing as long as you fed them. In a way, that was precisely what, and Phil mentioned it in his word earlier, that's what, exactly what sparked the Reformation. The church sold indulgences. This church exploited the people by guilt and fear. They raised funds by selling those indulgences, promising years of purgatory. That was the start of the Reformation, a rebellion against all of that corruption. If you know your history, of course, you'll know then that the king, uh, Edward, uh, sorry, Henry VIII, then sort of decided that actually I didn't want to be part of this corrupt church anymore. I mean, obviously, to suit his own ends. He was a man, after all, manipulative, uh, who had an eye on a pretty lady. It's never a good thing, is it? The temptation today is more subtle, to preach what people want to hear so they will be generous and you will be popular. The chapter is summed up in verses 10 and 11. Her leaders judge for a bribe, her priests teach for a price, and her prophets tell fortunes for money. Yet they lean upon the Lord and say, is not the Lord among us? No disaster will come upon us, provided you pay the right amount of money. People are exploited. God is profaned, and judgment is absolutely certain. The civil rulers judged for reward, while the religious leaders taught for hire and the prophets prophesied for food. These were the charges. So who's the witness? Well, Micah may have been in a minority. He may not have been popular, but he spoke the truth and God was with him in power. He was God's witness to his generation. Speaking to power, of course, is a, an incredibly difficult thing to do. That's why I'm glad that we, that is Sue and myself, and this church are members of the Evangelical Alliance who speak to the government on behalf of the marginalized, the poor, and the homeless. They raise the level of lobbying for the church and for the gospel and for the truth with the government. They are the united voice of Christian truth, and we should be adding our voice to the campaigns that they promote. Issues such as same-sex marriage, abortion laws, civil rights, and online safety for our children, these and many more are all in the purview of the Evangelical Alliance. But we're to be witnesses too. I believe the role of the church in relation to the government, to local government, to business, to civil leaders is threefold. One, we should pray for our leaders. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 2 says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Pray. Paul's word to us this morning. We pray 
for each other. We pray for those in authority over us. We should obey our leaders. Let everyone be subject to the governing authority, says Paul in Romans 13, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. We should obey. Obey the law. Obey the country. But we don't have to follow our leaders. And we have to be careful whose voice we are listening to. You see, there's a difference between obeying the law and who you are slavishly following. I think, I think we need to be a bit more discerning. You see, I think there's, there, right now there's a huge increase in erroneous teaching at the moment, teaching that bends the meaning of the Word of God to promote a specific agenda or a particular aspect of theology that's become popular. Saying what people want to hear has always been an issue in the church. Now that we have such immediacy and connection, we can listen to whoever sets our ears aflame and scratches where we're itching. Let me just give you one piece of advice, if I may. And you can do with this what you like. You can close your ears or you can take it on board. It's up to you. Can I urge you to ensure that you always seek the full counsel of the Scriptures, not just one aspect of it or from one favourite preacher? Finding a counter-discussion or a coherent critique to your preferences can be a way of hearing a wider debate and objectively assessing the veracity of what is being said. Don't just take it from one person. Find out what the bigger discussion is. Find out what the bigger issues are. Find out how that has come about. You might be experiencing, let me just take one aspect of it, you might be experiencing some kind of um, uh, influence of uh, health, wealth and happiness preaching, which will tell you, of course, God wants you to be rich. God wants you to be wealthy. God wants you to have land and lots of houses. And if you're a really, a really rich pastor, you could have three or four airplanes as well. <laughs> Woohoo! Um, there's obviously something wrong, you know. Yeah. Now they're bending the truth of God and the understanding of the scriptures to suit their own ends. I'm not a health, wealth, and happiness kind of preacher. I am happy. I am wealthy in the riches of God. And I am healthy, thanks to his unending grace. But don't be persuaded that you can have all these things because they are rightfully yours under God. And what happens when you don't, when you don't have them? It sort of unravels a bit, doesn't it? It just sort of... It grates. So... Um, just be careful who you're listening to and make sure that you have a more rounded perspective of what is being said. Moving on. Thirdly, the sentence. Corruption, exploitation, complacency and apostasy inevitably lead to divine judgment. The gift of the land, the liberty and the freedom that accompanies it will be taken away. You see, God said, okay, enough is enough. I'm going to allow Shalmaneser V to take over Samaria. I'm going to allow Nebuchadnezzar to sack uh, Jerusalem. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to exile all of the people. You can read all that in Daniel. You can read that in a lot of the prophets. You know, where are you, God? You know, this is our land. And God said, well, you've never honored me. You've never followed me. You've never done what I wanted you to do. You've never committed yourself to me. And so this is punishment. Don't be fooled. God's not some benevolent, nice old man with a nice long white beard sat on a cloud playing a harp, waiting to pat you on the head, say, there, 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 everything's fine. Don't be fooled. God is a God who still today exercises divine justice, judgment, and punishment. Please. Paul, uh, the writer to Hebrews I think in chapter 10 says it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Don't become complacent in your walk with God. Don't think, you know, I've done this for the same time every week, every day, da-di-da-di-da. I'm just in this rotten routine. 
God wants to break you out of all of that. The gift of that land, as I've said, liberty and freedom will be taken away as God's judgment is delivered. It happened then, and it happens now. I want to say something controversial. And I, uh, I'm sure some of you will disagree with me, but I don't care. Because I'm a big boy now, I can stand on my own two feet. And if you don't agree with me, that's fine. But please come and tell me you don't agree with me. Don't go and tell somebody else. Don't gossip. Okay, gossip is the killer of any church. All right, let's not be gossips. If you've got a problem with me, come and tell me. I'm a big boy. I won't bite your head off, okay? Well, many Christians turn a blind eye to the denial of human rights and proclaim that the present state of Israel is enjoying divine blessing. I am not so sure. If the promises apply today, so do the warnings. Because... God ultimately has the restoration of his people at the heart of all he does. God would send a Messiah born in Bethlehem, born from the common people. Mary and Joseph were just ordinary people, a carpenter and a young girl. And his mission was to save the common people. You see, it was prophesied and commanded in the Old Testament how they were to behave and care for the foreigner among them. How they were to look after those people who were not of the nation of Israel. They were to treat them like their own. Now, I've been, I was been speaking to Dawn Lawrence, who has been in Israel for 25 years, and um, talk, asking her about how did the Jewish people and the Palestinian people, how did they live together? Because in the place where she was, there were Israeli villages and Palestinian villages. And she said, we all, we, there was no conflict, there was no difficulty. We knew everyone was different, but we got along. And I think that's how God wants us. He wants us to understand the diversity of our world, but he wants us to get along. And I... I'm not sure that the vengeful way in which Israel have um, gone about what they're doing right now is necessarily very helpful or at all um, in any way biblical in terms of their Torah, their first five books of the Bible, which if you read those are full of God's warnings and God's judgment. I'll let you go away and think about that. See, unless the people of God take the worship of God as an obligation rather than a life choice, then the judgment of God could well be meted out. Finally, just this final note. If you are a leader anywhere, please take note. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament have clear parameters that we are to live by and by which we serve. Not for gain, profit or status, not for glory, power, or self-projection. We serve as ambassadors for Jesus Christ and as humble servants to the body of believers. Those who follow have clear parameters too. We are to support, help, and most importantly, pray for our leaders who serve us. However, where there may be a divergence from the word of God, just like Peter in Acts 5.29 who said we must obey God rather than human authority. Humility, mercy and justice must be an everyday experience in the life of the person who would be pleasing to God. Humility, mercy and justice. Are those the kind of values that people see when they look at you, when they look at me? Are you a person who is merciful? Are you a pe person who is humble? Are you a person who is approachable? Do you attempt? And it's okay to fail, but do you try to live a godly life in all holiness and righteousness? That is what's pleasing to God. Should we pray?
Thank you, Lord, for the word of God, which sometimes is a hard road and a difficult listen. Sometimes you remind us, Lord, that we can get into a rut and into a complacency which is unhelpful. So I pray you'd wake us up. Just like uh, Phil's word to us this morning, Lord, like that dam is going to break and that you're going to smash things, Lord. If you're going to smash us because of our complacency, Lord, wake us up. And we pray that those values of justice, mercy, and humility (coughs) would be reborn in us today. They might be reborn in me, Lord. That in all my interactions with people and places, I would be (coughs) just, merciful, and humble. And even though it might cost us, either financially or reputationally, Lord, I pray that you would work in us, that we might be just, merciful, and humble. And that as we are those kind of people, that Jesus would be seen in us. Thank you that he is the epitome, the the perfect, just, humble, merciful Saviour. And as we are being changed by one degree of glory to another, I pray that we would value those characteristics in our lives. That you would begin changing us to be more like And so we pray, Lord, this lesson might uh, find a place in our hearts that you would encourage us in our walk with you and challenge us where we might have the wrong perceptions. And graciously, graciously, Lord, move among us that we might promote and see the kingdom of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ made more real in our hearts and minds. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise in the city